Thank you for joining us today for another Money Talks presentation through our new ANA eLearning Academy. We've added many new e-learning opportunities to our website. If you have not checked out money.org in the last couple of months, I highly recommend watching the recent presentations we have archived, as well as checking out our upcoming schedule. Now, during this presentation, you may come up with questions. If you do, please use the chat or Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to send in your question, as all of our attendees are muted during this presentation. Your question will come to me and I will share the questions with our presenter at the end. If at the end of the presentation we're unable to get to all of the questions, I will send them to our presenter to answer. Toward the end of the presentation, I will be sending out a survey using the poll feature here in Zoom. Please answer each question honestly so that we can improve our presentations. The surveys will be shared anonymously with our presenter. So now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter for the day, Dr. Jesse Kraft. Dr. Kraft is going to be doing a talk called Before the Coinage Act of 1857, How Americans Spent Their Foreign Money. Now this talk focuses on the way foreign money circulated on a day-to-day -day basis, whether converting money from one currency to another, pricing goods in shillings and pence into the 19th century, or constantly worrying about counterfeits. Americans depended on a common toolbox of methods to navigate this complex system. Jesse Kraft is the assistant curator of, the American, of, of American Numismatics at the American Numismatic Society in New York City. A coin collector since childhood, he began with U.S. cents before expanding to world coinage. Now his interests lie in all material from the 16th century to the present, especially the way American numismatics, broadly defined, fits into a global context. Dr. Kraft, when you're ready, the floor is yours, sir. All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, here in New York City. Uh, if you hear any honking or anything, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with the ANS here, but we are situated uh, just where the Holland Tunnel enters. So that apparently angers a lot of people for whatever reason when they're trying to get into it. Uh, so if you hear any honking of co uh, car horns, that's what it is. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here and just get right into it uh, for my presentation entitled uh, Before the Coinage Act of 1857, How Americans Spent Their Foreign Money. Uh, I'm going to uh, cover a few different topics in this. Uh, first is the Coinage Act of 1857 itself. Um, just to give you a sense of, of what it says and, and you know, what, what uh, happened after that and before. Uh, give you a brief um, introduction to the various foreign coinage that circulated in the United States and in the colonies before that. Uh, some different methods of conversion that people used to convert their foreign coinage in order to be able to understand its value. Um, different weighing systems for uh, specifically for foreign coinage, and finally the uh, state shilling and pence system uh, that's developed in uh, the different colonies turned states uh, and how this fits into uh, foreign coinage. So the Coinage Act of 1857, uh, this was enacted on February 21st of 1857, and it generally had two main goals. The first was to remove the legal tender status of foreign coinage. And the second, uh, completely different yet somewhat related, uh, was to modify uh, United States copper coinage. Uh, many people know this as the transition from large cent to small cent, and also what uh, got rid of uh, the end of uh, the half cent piece. Uh, but for this presentation in particular, I'm going to focus on section three, which pertains to um, foreign coinage, and that reads, and be it further enacted, that all former acts authorizing the currency of foreign gold and silver coins and declaring the same illegal tender in payment for debts are hereby repealed. So with that, uh, foreign coinage was no longer um, legally allowed to be used uh, as legal tender in the United States. Uh, so before this, uh, and illegally a little bit,
after this, but primarily before this, uh, there were various coins in circulation in the colonies and the, and the states. Uh, the biggest one that most people are familiar with is the Spanish American coinage. Uh, this was primarily uh, revolved around the Spanish American eight reales, uh, which was divisible by fractions instead of decimals like our current United States dollar is. Um, so there are eight reales, four, two, one, and half re uh, a half real coin. Um, and these essentially dominated uh, circulation um, from the mid 18th century up to this point in the 1850s. Um, despite the fact that the United States men struck their own coins, uh, these still uh, circulated very heavily. Uh, English coins also circulated um, early on in the 16th century. These were primarily the coins that circulated, uh, even though since we were a British colony, they weren't exactly quote unquote foreign coins because we were, you know, an English colony, but primarily there were shillings and sixpence. And then later on in the uh, 19th century, uh, half pennies and farthings also circulated. Um, though once we, um, initiated the, the American Revolution and were at war with Britain. This uh, essentially ended, um, though the copper coins were still in circulation for a few more decades until the mint was able to um, successfully introduce uh, large quantities of United States copper coins. Uh, Portuguese American coins that came out of Brazil uh, were rather important to uh, United States commerce. Uh, this primarily revolved around the gold 6400 uh, race, which we knew in the colonies and in the states as a half Joe. Uh, and this was worth $8 uh, or three pounds. Um, we also had uh, their silver dollar size coin, which was a 960 race piece. And and those are actually also heavily counterfeited uh, in this area too, specifically in New York. Uh, we also had French coins uh, in the 18th century. These were a lot of copper coins or uh, billing coins. Um, and then in the 19th century, we had uh, silver five franc coins, which were equivalent to 93 cents. Uh, now at the bottom here, this is uh, um, an entry from the account book of Philadelphia goldsmith Thomas Shields. Uh, and I love this entry because it's uh, all within a single uh, purchase. He used every single one of the coins I just talked about. Um, six half Joes at uh, five pounds each. Um, I said that there were three pounds, but this was uh, in December of 1776 during uh, the beginning of the American Revolution. So all these prices are actually inflated a bit. Uh, 20 whole dollars, 18 half dollars, and one French crown. Uh, 70 English shillings, five English guineas, and three pieces of gold. Uh, so that, you know, kind of is a microcosm of the different foreign coins that were in circulation in the uh, freshly minted uh, United States at the time. Uh, one of the main things that people needed to successfully um, use and circulate foreign, foreign coinage uh, was to be able to convert the different types into a common unit of account. Uh, so this here we have uh, to our left a table of all the different coins, foreign coins that were in circulation at the time um, and their respective values. Um, this actually came out of a lid of a money scale. Um, uh, they were commonly um, exchanged charts were commonly put there because uh, that was one of the places that people needed it the most as they were weighing the coins. Uh, they would often have the weight of the coin as long as it's as well as its respective value. Uh, but you can see that um, it doesn't just list it into one uh, different currency. There's um, right here. There's New York sterling, Connecticut, New York, uh, Philadelphia. In Quebec, and uh, that's something that we'll get into a little bit later. Those are the different uh, state shilling systems that existed at the time. Uh, so different common uh, units of account that we can talk about today. There's dollars, pens, yen, or pounds, yen, and euros. Those are things that we use today. Um, and back, you know, in the 17th, 18th, 
18th century, there were reales, uh, you know, and pounds were the big ones, French francs, and before that, uh, libras. Um, uh, and while using the coinage of several different empires, uh, finding a common unit of account was important to, to locally define them. And that was the main goal of being able to successfully uh, give or use um, a coin with one person uh, was to be able to define it on local terms and values. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few of the different methods that people used. Uh, one of the primary ones was known as reduction. Um, and it was it's the basic method to do this was to reduce the given amount of money into the lowest required denomination and then divide it. Uh, so here, this uh, to the left, this example that I have is actually from an arithmetic book uh, by Nicholas Pike called A New and Complete System of Arithmetic. Uh, and this book was the most uh, heavily used math book um, of its day. It was first published in the 1790s and uh, repeatedly uh, issued in many different editions until the, until the 1850s. Uh, so the example in this book um, is in 59 half joes, 37 moidors, 45 guineas, 63 pistoles, 24 English crowns, and 19 dollars. How many pounds, half joes, moidors, guineas, pistoles, English crowns, dollars, shillings, pence, and farthings? Now that may seem absolutely crazy. Um, but it was common knowledge that was needed at the time. And as um, the um, account book entry of Thomas Shields showed that, you know, it was practical knowledge that, you know, could have um, absolutely occurred at, at, at any given time. Um, uh, one of the most necessary uh, requirements for this, though, was uh, conversion rates. Uh, which, uh, again, going back to the exchange rate chart that was that I showed that was uh, posted in the lid of the um, of the money uh, scales, um, you couldn't really do any of this without that. Uh, so here's another example: um, in 275 half joes, how many moidors, guineas, pistoles, dollars, shillings, and sixpence of each, the like number? Uh, I found this interesting because it didn't necessarily um, uh, equate into a single um, uh, exchange rate, but what they were trying to do was find out how many uh, of the latter, the moidors, guineas, et cetera, um, of an equal val of an equal number uh, were needed. So uh, in order to do this, um, uh, you would take all these different uh, uh, coins based on their um, amount in shillings and sixpence, add them all up, and then uh, you would take that as your divisor. So a moidor is worth 36 shillings, guinea is 28 shillings, a pistole 22 shillings, a dollar six shillings, um, and then you would find how many sixpence. So essentially multiply that by two and add that up to get 187 sixpence. And then you would need to know how many uh, shillings are in a half joe, um, and then multiply that by 275, and then divide it by the 187, and then you would find that there were 141 of each of these coins uh, would equal uh, 275 half joes, and you would have 16 shillings, six pence left over. Kind of complicated, but again, this was something that was needed uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in colonial America. Another uh, method that people use was called the single rule of three. Uh, and this was to find out if you knew uh, how many uh, or how much something was worth, um, how many, how much several of them would be worth essentially. So uh, if A is to B, then C is to X. Uh, and of course, X is what you were trying to figure out. Um, and there's a couple of examples at the bottom. If $1 be worth 56 and 3 fifth pence, what are $500 worth? And that would be um, 117 pounds, 18 shillings, four pence. And if one pistole be worth 17 shillings, one fifth, what are 100 
pistol is, and the answer is 86 pounds. Uh, weighing foreign coins was essential um, to detect counterfeits. Uh, it wasn't necessarily done all of the time uh, with every single foreign coin that someone came across, but if people um, uh, thought that a coin was either counterfeit or extremely lightweight, they would put it on the money scales. Uh, the money scales uh, to the left uh, were from Boston from the mid uh, 18th century, and then the one on the right is um, uh, a 19th century scale, uh, Marinville's money scale. This was actually patented in the United States uh, on, uh, I think, January of 1857. So it was only like five weeks before the end of foreign coinage circulating in the United States that Marinville um, patented this money scale, uh, which you can see uh, was able to weigh coins in both foreign gold, uh, foreign silver, as well as United States gold and silver coins. Um, in the course of my research, um, I found only a handful of instances of people actually weighing foreign coinage. Uh, this top example is also from uh, the account book of Thomas Shields of Philadelphia, um, where he uh, gave Joseph Whittle uh, a discount um, made for his part of loss of a counterfeit balloon uh, as a gram. So he actually credited his account uh, one shilling ten pence um, because he was accidentally given a counterfeit doubloon that was a gram light. And then on the bottom here, um, uh, in 1791, uh, this person received from Lieutenant uh, Pierce uh, one piece of gold that was called a dollar, which weighed uh, five, uh, I think it's five uh, penny weights and five and a half grains, and then also a piece of gold that was supposed to be worth uh, one pound one shilling, uh, which um, was only worth uh, 14 shillings, six and a half pence. Uh, now I'm going to transition to um, talking about state shillings and pence. Um, I want to read this little vignette uh, that was from uh, the Polynesian um, newspaper from Honolulu, but the article initially came out in the Knickerbocker, which is the New York City uh, newspaper. Uh, and it's of a woman who is traveling uh, up and down the East Coast and uh, runs into the fact, she discovers the fact that um, the shillings and pence are worth, have different uh, values in each of the respective states. Uh, so she says, how much did you say it was? Three and six pence, asked the lady. Four and six pence, if you please, ma'am, said the driver. Oh, four and six pence. And after a good deal of fumbling and shaking of her pockets, she at last produced a half dollar and a York shilling and put them into the driver's hand. That is not enough, ma'am, said the driver. I want nine pence more. What, ain't we in New York State? In New York State, she asked eagerly. No, ma'am, replied the driver. It is six shillings New York money. Well, said the lady, I used to be quite good at reckoning when I was, at, uh, when I was to home in the state of New Hampshire. I've reckoned up many a fish voyage, but since I've got so far from home, I believe I am beginning to lose my mental faculties. Uh, so they talk about two different coins here, a half dollar, which we all know what that is, and a York shilling, which didn't actually exist, but, um, but was in fact um, the, a local name for, for a very specific coin. So how did we get to that point of uh, different state shillings and pence? Uh, well, it began in the 17th century, uh, like I mentioned before, we initially had uh, British sixpence and shillings that circulated in the colonies. Um, then once the colonies began to uh, take place in, uh, in trade with um, more, specific, more specifically uh, the Caribbean and the West Indies, um, Spanish American coinage began to enter circulation as well. Uh, but instead of calling them their Spanish names, we, uh, or the colonists, um, uh, began to uh, place English names on them uh, in their English values. Uh, different regions uh, had different values for Spanish American specie. 
1675 in New York, uh, eight reales was worth six shillings, six pence. Uh, in New England in 1642, it was legally defined at five shillings, uh, though in the 1670s, John Hull uh, used them and traded them at six shillings, three pence. Uh, in the Mid-Atlantic prior to 16 or 1725, they circulated at five shillings. Uh, though despite this, um, in London, they were, they traded hands at four shillings, six pence. Um, but Queen Anne in 1704 declared that they were only allowed to circulate at six shillings throughout the American colonies, but this never actually fully took hold and they continued to circulate at their, uh, at the different rates uh, that they, um, the colonists felt that they were actually worth. Uh, in 1690, the state of uh, the colony of Massachusetts first instituted uh, paper currency in the colonies. Uh, and this began to depreciate uh, compared to Spanish dollars. Um, as you can see the chart on the right, uh, and around uh, 1715, they traded hands at uh, nine shillings per Spanish American dollar. And by 1750, there were more than 45 shillings per Spanish American dollar in Massachusetts. Uh, throughout the 18th century, because of this inflation, they, the different colonies, mostly in, uh, or especially in uh, New England, um, instituted these various uh, uh, monetary uh, reforms. Um, and they were called old tenor, new tenor, and then eventually lawful money. Uh, um, some colonies also had uh, a middle tenor because they had a fourth uh, monetary reform. Uh, the table on the right uh, shows what some old tenor to lawful money conversion rates were. Um, and on the bottom here, you can see that some people continued to use both um, or different types of uh, these different tenors. Um, at the same time, and it says to cash lent uh, old tenor 100 shillings, lawful money 13 shillings, four pence. Um, this was in 1739 in, in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Uh, eventually, the colonial shillings begin to settle, uh, and by the American Revolution, uh, most of these individual shillings and pence systems did, in fact, settle uh, in New England and Virginia. Um, they were worth six shillings per dollar uh, in New York and North Carolina. A dollar was worth eight shillings uh, in the Mid-Atlantic states. A dollar was worth seven shillings, six pence in Georgia, five shillings. And in South Carolina, four shillings, three pence. So this continued to fluctuate uh, for some time afterwards. Um, so as you can see, uh, a, well, as a dollar was still worth a dollar in these places, uh, but this is really how uh, these different colonies turned states divided the dollar um, is really the key uh, to understanding how these, uh, these work on a day-to-day -day basis for colonists. Um, eventually they started using dollars. Um, this, the first uh, usage of dollar and paper currency was in 1767 in Maryland. Um, and then some you know, other states uh, also began to adopt the Spanish mill dollar for use in their paper currency. Um, but throughout this time, they continued to alternate between the use of dollars and, um, and their respective uh, shillings and pence system and pounds. Uh, continental currency was helped use to pay um, for the American Revolution, and they were denominated in dollars um, from as low as one sixth of a dollar up to eighty dollars. Um, but you know, a sixth of a dollar, or a third of a dollar, or eighty dollars might sound like such an obscure um, denomination, but they actually made complete sense when uh, you calculate them in. Um, these different state shillings and pence systems. Uh, for example, one sixth of a dollar was worth uh, one, uh, one New England shilling, 
uh, one third of a dollar was worth two New England shillings and $80 was actually worth exactly 100 New York shillings. So they made sense to the, uh, to the uh, early Americans at the time, even though they, they sound like such bizarre denominations to us now. Um, even the uh, shillings um, saw uh, inflation when compared to um, silver and specie. Um, uh, the, like the Spanish American eight reals, for example, in New York generally exchange hands at seven and, uh, seven and a half shillings. Um, I'm sorry, in Philadelphia rather. Uh, though this went up to 11 and a quarter shillings uh, by December of that year, uh, though they quickly um, settled once again. So once uh, after the Coinage Act of 1792, um, the United States enacted uh, the formation of a mint, uh, the size, weight, and fineness of the U.S. silver dollar uh, was based pretty much one to one on the Spanish American uh, mill dollar of the time. Um, and as a result, uh, nomenclature for the mill dollars, uh, which are actually um, English words uh, or denominations, also carried over to the US uh, counterparts. Um, in 1907, historian Charles A. White said, as a curious fact, that although the Spanish supply then constituted the principal part of our current coins, Spanish names for those coins were practically discarded by the people of the United States. Uh, so when it was all said and done and we enacted our own uh, decimal system, uh, this is what uh, each of the dollars were worth uh, in shillings. Uh, so in New England and Virginia, you had uh, 16.7 cents per shilling. Uh, New England and North Carolina you had 12 and a half cents per shilling. Um, in uh, the Mid-Atlantic region, 13 and a third cents per shilling. In Georgia, 20 cents per shilling. And in South Carolina, 21.4 cents per shilling. Uh, and throughout this period, you would often see things that were priced in shillings rather than in dollars and cents. Now, the one real and half real coins uh, were the Spanish American coins that circulated the most heavily uh, in this region. Um, the eight reales uh, were generally used for uh, international trade when they uh, were of good silver. Um, and this system lasted all the way up through the 1850s due to the inefficiencies of the United States Mint. And different regions had different names for the coins, often based on the, re the respective state shilling and pen systems. Um, here's a quote from historian Israel Ward Andrews in 1886. The four pence, the nine pence, the picayune, the shilling, the six pence, the fip, and the levy these the reader would naturally understand to be seven different coins, whereas the seven were in fact only two with various names. And those two different coins were the, the one real and the half real coins. And then the Evening Star in 1856 said, in fact, every locality has a separate epithet for the smooth faced little joker. Uh, to the right here, we have uh, a chart of the different names and values of these two coins on where they circulated up and down the East Coast. Uh, in New England, the four pence, uh, the New York six pence, the Mid-Atlantic fip, and the Southern Picayune uh, were all the same coin, the half real, um, and they were all equal to six and a quarter cents, even though they're worth four, six, and five pence in the different states. Uh, and the same goes for the one real, they're all worth 12 and a half cents. Uh, but had uh, different values in the respective state shilling pence systems. Uh, also in England, you had a what was known as the one in six, uh, which was uh, the two reales coin, which was worth 25 cents. Um, most people uh, are familiar with uh, the fact that uh, two bits are worth a quarter. Uh, that was really a Southern uh, thing um, in uh, really, in, especially in New Orleans, uh, they called um, the 
uh, one real coin a bit and therefore the two reales coins two bits. Uh, that really wasn't up and down the East Coast or, or really anywhere else. But, um, but people like to say that, you know, all Americans used to call them two bits when it was really only one region that, that did that uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Israel Ward Andrews again says these terms and their pronunciation pertain to the prevalent serious speech of people and were in no way exceptional or frivolous. So what he's saying there is that uh, this wasn't, um, you know, uh, you know, one off things or, you know, an occasional uh, saying, but this is what people called these coins uh, in these specific regions. Uh, the FIP and the levy I'd like to talk about in particular, that was um, uh, the local terms for these coins uh, in and around Philadelphia and, and the, the states that encircle that area. Uh, FIP is, uh, it was, as you can see, there were five pennies, uh, which they called a five penny bit or a FIP penny, or they shortened that to FIP. So that's where FIP comes from. Uh, and same with the levy, it was originally an 11 penny bit or uh, a levy, they shortened that too. The penny, uh, people um, always, you know, today always complain that we call pennies pennies and not one cent pieces. And they say that we never struck pennies, which is absolutely true. Uh, but when we say penny, historically speaking, we're not talking about English pennies. Uh, what we're talking about is the New York penny. Um, in New York, uh, uh, one shilling was worth 12 and a half uh, pence, um, or 12 and a half cents rather. Uh, and if you divide that by 12, you have uh, 1.04 cents. And if, of course, if you, didn't, you know, if you round that to one cent, you have one penny or one New York penny. So the next time you say, you know, you call it a penny and somebody says, you know, we never struck pennies. You can you can tell them uh, that you're not talking about English pennies. You're in fact talking about New York pennies. So how did Americans calculate these shillings? Uh, Amer uh, items were priced in shillings and pence. Uh, post 1800, they converted the total um, into shilling or into dollars. So you could see on this top example uh, the account book of Lewis Page, who imported toys. Uh, into New York City from Europe uh, in April 1832. Um, he uh, was selling tops at uh, six shillings each. Um, so he uh, you know, um, purchased 15 dozen of them at six shillings. So if you take 15 times six, you have $11.25. Uh, same with the, the second listing for tops, eight times nine shillings equals nine dollars, and the same uh, with the last entry. Um, so those are that's a specific example of, of New York shillings. The bottom example uh, were cabinet makers in Virginia. Um, and if you look at the, um, the window cornices at the bottom, uh, six shillings each, um, and there were three of them. Uh, so six times three equals 18. And if you know that there are six shillings per dollar, um, 18 divided by six equals $3. Uh, the Reverend, Reverend John Leavitt in 1857 says that for small circulation and payments and marketing, husker, huskering um, and the like, a duodecimal system is also wanted and preferable to the other. The American people during 60 years have clung to their well-worn shillings and sixpence, perceiving them to be a great public convenience. So people considered this to be uh, easier and, and in fact superior to simply using the uh, regular uh, decimal system that we are accustomed to today. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, while a decimal system, which is base 10, uh, work well for addition and subtraction and multiplication. The duodecimal system, which is base 12, provided mental ease for division, uh, which was, you know, an important thing in uh, the day-to-day -day usage of coins. And sometimes even multiplication was easier uh, using the base 12 system. 
Uh, for example, uh, in the 1850s, uh, a peck of corn was worth, was equal to 75 cents. Uh, and if you knew that in New York, um, 75 cents equaled uh, four shillings, six pence, and you wanted to buy a dozen pecks of corn, instead of multiplying 12 by 75, you would only have to multiply 12 by four and a half, which, um, you know, which is easier. Uh, in 1863, economist Henry Dunning McLeod uh, mentioned that commercial instinct utterly condemns decimal subdivision. So he, um, you know, kind of uh, agrees that regular decimal subdivision is in fact uh, inferior to the duodecimal system. Um, ultimately, fractions were so ingrained into the mental algorithms of humans that it took several, seven, several generations of Americans to fully uh, compute in a decimal matter. Um, really, the duodecimal system and fractions are what people, uh, humans, um, calculated in for, for centrally, centuries and millennia uh, prior to this. So the decimal system uh, really was just uh, a complete oddball um, when it was introduced in the late 18th century. And it wasn't something that people could just all of a sudden begin to calculate in just because the United States enacted a law that said that's how we now calculated our coins. And as I showed, it took, you know, again, several generations for that to become a reality. So learning to use the state shillings, uh, just like the account book or the arithmetic books that I showed earlier, uh, there were many, many pages devoted to uh, the state shillings and how they were calculated in different states. Um, the Kate, the uh, example on the left, uh, to reduce Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, Maryland, and Ohio currency into federal money, uh, the, do the dollar being worth seven shillings, six pence. Uh, this was, uh, pretty convenient because you had a little rule to do it. And all you had to do was multiply by eight and divide the product by three, and the quotient would be the answer. So if you had uh, 243 pounds in New Jersey currency and you wanted to convert that into federal money, you just uh, multiplied by eight to get 1944, and then divide it by three, and you had $648. Uh, this example to the left, I love because it just talks about so many different coins and how um, difficult it is to our uh, present day brains to, to compute this. Um, but it talks about, you know, like what are the foreign coins which are in general use, the Spanish 12 and a half cent and the six and a quarter cent. This is the FIP and the levy that I was talking about before. Uh, what is the 12 and a half cent worth in New England, nine pence. Uh, the six and a quarter, four pence, uh, half penny, or the four pence, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, if you look at number 361, a little bit further than halfway down, is a really interesting example. Um, when a boy from New England goes to New York, what will his nine pences and four pences be called there? If he should go to Philadelphia, what would they be called there? If he should bring away with him levies, New York shillings, and fips what would they pass for in his own state? And uh, again, this was, you know, not something that was necessarily uh, a question brought up to confuse a person, but is because uh, that person uh, needed to know this on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if he or she was to travel. So for multi-region and national industries, um, they were some of the first to uh, calculate fully in cents um, and dollars and cents, uh, while others uh, would have to um, list their prices in uh, multiple different states, uh, shillings or pence systems. This New York uh, newspaper advertisement on the left uh, was for a steamship called the Joe Johnson that went in between Washington and Alexandria. Um, so they uh, advertised their rates in both Virginia money, Maryland money, as well as New York, because I presume that they expected to have uh, people uh, from New York also in the area. So they uh, listed their uh, rates as uh, 
um, Nine Pence, Virginia, a Maryland, a Maryland levy, and a York shilling, uh, which all sound like three different things, but they're actually worth exactly the same um, amount of money. Now, publications uh, that expected to sell nationally uh, were among the first to, to kind of shy away from their different state shillings and pence systems um, and calculate in dollars and cents, even though uh, the dollars and cents that they used still equated to um, these state systems. For example, for example, Woodworth's youth cabinet uh, sold for 12 and a half cents um, instead of the New York shilling, even though it was equivalent. But if they wanted to sell the book in, say, Georgia or New England, and their price was a York shilling, um, the people there wouldn't necessarily understand what they meant. Um, uh, same with uh, Farrer's Cambridge Mathematics uh, had the price of $4.67, which sounds um, like an extremely odd number, but is equal to exactly 28 New, New England shillings. Uh, shaving was a problem, and shaving was um, a scheme to try and get the uh, smallest amount of money from a person. Um, uh, a scheme to receive something for less than advertised due to the misgivings between the decimal system and the state shillings and pence. And it usually only consisted of sums of a half cent or a quarter of a cent. Uh, this uh, newspaper clipping to the right is about a woman uh, who's trying to get um, a piece of candy, a piece of penny candy for essentially half price. Um, uh, she wanted to buy a, a piece of uh, candy for one cent. Uh, and the confectioner, under, uh, she gave a quarter as her payment. Um, and for the change, she received a 12 and a half cent piece. Uh, a 10 cent piece and one penny, which equals 23 and a half cents. Uh, the woman uh, said that another cent was due to her. Uh, the confectioner refused to give it. Um, and at the very bottom, uh, she, he says, uh, this isn't the first time that she's done that, remarked the confectioner as the woman retired. It was only a trick to get the candy for nothing. Uh, I've humored her several times, but I'm not going to do it any longer. Uh, there were privately struck state shillings and pence as well. Um, these are really the only uh, physical uh, incarnations of, of these in, in coin form. Um, there are some paper money examples as well, uh, but the piece all the way to the left is a one shilling token um, issued by the Corporation of Philadelphia in the 1830s. Uh, you have a three shilling six pence token issued by the ladies restaurant and ice cream saloon in New York City in the 1850s. Uh, there's a two shilling six pence token from Moss's Hotel in also New York City. And finally, a one shilling nine pence uh, from Sweeney's Hotel uh, in New York City. Uh, these three on the right, uh, they had, uh, they issued tokens in, in several di different denominations, not just those shown. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that you can collect, uh, you know, kind of complete sets of these. Uh, some of them go from six pence all the way up to, to several shillings. Uh, so how did the state shillings and pence system come to an end? Uh, this initially began with the Coinage Act of 1819. Um, and this act uh, uh, was the result of um, Latin American independence, uh, that whole decade from 1810 and really into the 1820s, um, the Spanish American empire began to fall apart and different uh, states, countries began to appear beginning with Mexico in 1810 and then that continued down into South America. Now, as these independent uh, nations began to issue coins, um, they were not accepted as legal tender in the same way that the Spanish American coins were. Uh, we were, we, you know, as a country in the United States, we, we gravitated towards the Spanish American coins and weren't necessarily familiar with the uh, coins of the newly independent um, Latin American countries. Um, later on, um, there were a few examples uh, like, uh, of uh, these Latin American countries that did 
um, that we did accept their coins for legal tender, but this, you know, kind of sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't based on uh, the results of different uh, subsequent assays that, that occurred from the United States Mint. Now, Gresham's Law is uh, an economic law that was named by uh, Thomas Gresham um, in the 16th century. Um, and this essentially states that uh, bad money drives good money out of circulation. So if you have the choice of spending, say, a full weight uh, silver coin um, or a lightweight silver coin, but they have the same exact value, you as a consumer are going to use uh, and spend the lightweight one and retain the full weight one for yourself. And this is essentially what happened in the United States throughout the 1830s and 40s. Um, after uh, the coin Act of 1819, uh, these coins continued to circulate and um, they continued to wear and wear down uh, more and more. Uh, so by the 1830s, uh, a lot of our coins were uh, that were in day-to-day -day commerce were simply extremely worn and damaged uh, Spanish-American silver. Um, the New York Herald in the top right in 1853 says the state of things had vanished almost entirely from circulation, all silver coin of full weight. And what little remains in the hands of the community consists principally of the worn pieces of Spanish coins, coinage and their fractional parts of a dollar. Um, the the mint director himself, George N. Eckert, in 1852 corroborated this uh, when he said the war in Spanish coin, uh, which now monopolizes our circulation. Uh, these four coins, coins that I uh, have pictured here, uh, the second one and the fourth one um, are counter stamped by uh, companies in New York City. So despite the fact that they're of uh, Spanish American and Latin American origins, uh, we know that those coins were, in fact, uh, in New York City at one point. Um, the 1842 annual assay is important uh, because they actually, this is one of the first times that they actually assayed some of the lower denomination Spanish American coins because of the state of things, which was getting uh, pretty bad. And they found that FIPS, which were supposed to be worth six and a quarter cents, were actually worth 5.1 cents on average. Uh, levies were worth 11.1, and Spanish American quarters were worth an average of 23 and a half cents. Uh, in 1845, the Boston Courier um, suggested that a concerted effort should be made to reduce the Spanish fractions of a dollar to the same value with our coin or drive them from circulation altogether. By putting the FIPS and levies on par with our dimes and half dimes, the object could be easily accomplished. Uh, in 1845, the same year, the post office uh, became one of the first uh, entities to begin to uh, accept FIPS and levies at the rate of five cents and 10 cents, uh, which began to put them at par with our uh, national decimal system. Uh, there were federal attempts to, to get rid of FIPS and levies. Uh, this began with the Coinage Act of 1853, which was the result of the, um, the uh, gold rush in California. Uh, once large amounts of gold began to be discovered, uh, it upset the, um, the ratio between gold and silver um, to, uh, I think, to um, the degree of 3%, uh, so that if you had a dollar's worth of gold, uh, it would be equivalent to uh, $1.03 in silver, um, if you, even if you were holding a silver dollar. Uh, so the Coinage Act of 1853 began, began to, um, uh, the Mint began to take in these worn pieces of Spanish-American silver and turn them into um, uh, Spanish or of the United States coins of a reduced weight. Uh, we know these to be the um, the dimes, quarter dollars, and, do and half dollars, uh, the with arrows uh, or with arrows and rays, as the uh, as this half dollar shows. Finally, we get to the Coinage Act of eighteen fifty seven. Um, 
And this is, you know, this was the death knell for Spanish American coins and, and really all foreign coins, uh, even the you know, uh, Spanish American coins were, were the primary, um, uh, you know, cause of this at this point. Uh, and um, as I said at the beginning, this got rid of the Spanish American coins as well as the large cent and uh, and uh, the mint traded these two out for the flying eagle scent. Uh, there's a little quote here from a newspaper at the bottom that says, every man and boy in the crowd had his packet of coin with them and returned for the diminutive little strangers, I'm talking about the, uh, the flying eagle scent. And you can, you, at the time, you could bring uh, your Spanish American coin at the, um, uh, in, in um, sums of $5 or more, but no more than $20, and then exchange them for, for the flying equal sum. Uh, and then, but even still, it still took several generations for the, for the term shillings to leave the daily vocabulary of, of people in the United States. Um, the Evening Star in 1857 said, though the inconvenient Spanish currency has departed, we must continue to put up with its nomenclature and its ideality of value for a long time to come, we fear. An almost entire change of the nation's habit in a matter of hourly practice through life. Uh, and in 1884, the American uh, said nothing but government pressure forced the discontinuance of this kind of subdivision, subdivision and no coins would be more popular with the American people than levies and FIPS if our mint would coin them. Um, so, you know, uh, these two newspaper clippings are saying, you know, that we're going to have to put up with, uh, you know, the, the Spanish American currency, while the other one is saying, you know, it would actually be a good thing if the mint would, would coin, um, 12 and a half cent piece and six and a quarter cent pieces. And this actually happened, uh, all the way until World War One in some places. Uh, in 1895, Charles T. Tatman stated that rural New York and New England still continued to use the, the term shillings. Uh, in 1907, Charles A. White found that several rural regions of Pennsylvania and New Jersey continued to use the word levies. And believe it or not, it wasn't until 1950 that New Hampshire officially discarded the um, the use of shillings and pence uh, with the referendum um, uh, money and shillings and pence amendment uh, that only passed with 52.5% of the votes. Um, so even then they, they almost continued to use the word shillings and pence um, as their official money after that. Uh, this receipt to the right is the latest um, uh, example that I personally have found of using uh, New York shillings and it's from 1874 um, when they're selling reams of paper for uh, one shilling each. That's the end of it. Thank you very much and hopefully there's some questions now. All right, Jesse, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, so folks, I'll now be launching a survey for everyone to fill out. Let me just Get that going, please, before you leave the room, folks. Uh, if uh, you wouldn't mind, uh, we'd really appreciate uh, taking it. It is a multiple choice uh, survey. Uh, if you need to elaborate on one of your answers or have additional comments, please email them to seminars at money.org. Uh, Brianna Victor will receive them and will respond to you accordingly. So we did have a couple of questions uh, come in through the uh, Q&A. Um, let's see, one person asks, uh, what about gold sovereigns? Were they commonly used? And if so, how often? I'm not sure if they are including half sovereigns in that too, but- uh, uh, They weren't used as often. Gold sovereigns and half sovereigns weren't um, struck until, uh, beginning until 1816 is when they came out. Uh, and by that point, we weren't necessarily, um, we didn't necessarily see those in circulation as often. Uh, in fact, I believe it's the same um, uh, British act that created the sovereign also uh, reinforced the British uh, law and ideality that English silver 
and gold couldn't leave the country. Uh, so if one did leave England at the time, uh, it would have done so Ill illegally on their part. Um, so we didn't necessarily see them all that often. I'm sure that they did once in a while, um, and Americans probably knew what they were worth from, uh, you know, looking at different exchange rates and exchange charts. But as far as being a daily occurrence, that probably wasn't necessarily the case, um, you know, by 1816 and later. Huh. All right. So uh, another question for you. Um, so in colonial times, um, let's see, uh, for larger purchase, such as an average house, uh, do you know how payment was made? Was it large denomination bills, checks, multiple gold coins, etc.? And were smaller everyday purchases, such as groceries, uh, usually mixed in uh, with English and Spanish coins or just colonial paper money? Let me uh, go to the first part again. Or? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, for larger purchases, well, uh, one thing I should say is that the majority of transactions throughout, you know, all the period, uh, you know, especially the colonial period, were primarily still using like a barter cash system uh, where, you know, uh, people would trade uh, goods or services rather than physical currency. Uh, but in order to do that and be able to calculate it in their account books, they would act, they would still put a um, monetary value to it and uh, and then trade that way. So, um, uh, you know, like if you had like a candle maker or something like that, um, you know, he or she could, you know, trade their candles, um, you know, to somebody uh, and they would still put a monetary value, um, still put it in their book and then, you know, their accounts would... Uh, you know, accrue that way, and then they would settle their accounts by accepting, uh, you know, the goods or services of, of the person who bought it. So uh, I've, something like 60% of colonial transactions actually didn't um, include the physical transacting of any money whatsoever, uh, whether it be, you know, gold, silver, or paper. Um, and, and the majority of them were, were using uh, cash barter systems. Um, second part of the question. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, were smaller everyday purchases such as groceries, uh, usually in mixed English and Spanish coins or uh, colonial paper? Yeah, that goes the same, uh, whether it's big or small amounts, uh, you know, it's really, you know, the majority was cash barter. Um, but of um, uh, transactions that did use um, that did use money, uh, it was primarily, um, uh, you know, the percentage of that was primarily paper-based as well. Um, uh, but often they were denominated in, in these state shillings and pence systems that were based off of uh, foreign coinage. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, weren't Dutch uh, dollars and stivers still around? Uh, yeah, they were. Uh, they weren't necessarily used nationwide, and uh, by the time you get to um, uh, like the mid 18th century, they were being used less and less. Um, uh, you could find the Dutch coins primarily in you know New Amsterdam, which is now New York. Um, you know, they didn't necessarily circulate on on such a wide basis like the Spanish American currency did. Um, and, you know, they didn't necessarily end right away. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, 1804 dollars that was struck in the 1850s is struck over uh, a, a Swiss dollar. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, these, these coins were still circulating to some degree. Um, you know, that coin in particular is probably used as a host coin uh, or an undertype for the Spanish American dollar, for the 1804 dollar, because um, uh, because it wasn't as readily acceptable as, you know, Spanish American dollar was. So they saw that as a proper host coin, uh, for, for the 1804 dollar. Oh, very cool. So let's see, uh, one other question here. Um, let's see, why did people not arbitrate arbitrage in the way, uh, the differences in the value of the dollar between states? It seems you could, but a dollar for four sixths in Carolina and state for 
sevens in New York. Maybe they meant sell it. I'm not sure if there's a typo or something may have happened there. I apologize, Jesse. No, no, no. Uh, I, I have it up here. It seems like, you, well, uh, if I am understanding this uh, properly, uh, one way to um, that you have to remember is that like a dollar was still worth a dollar uh, in each of these places. And it's really the subdivision uh, of how these different states divided the dollar, which was the, the important part and local uh, to these different places. Um, so if you took uh, a dollar in, um, you know, in, uh, in South Carolina, as this question is asking, and took it to New York, you wouldn't actually be making any money per se. Uh, you know, if you had 100 silver Spanish American dollars and you took it from the Carolinas and brought it to New York, you would still have 100 Spanish American dollars. But if you, when you try to spend them, uh, you know, on a local level, uh, that's when the confusion and the differences in exchange, um, you know, really took hold and, uh, um, and the confusion ensued. Uh, you would have the different amount of state shillings and pence, but you would still have the same value per se. Um, you know, and you could, uh, if you wanted to exchange them for the different state shillings and pence, but you wouldn't necessarily be gaining any true value in the sense uh, that you would uh, think that uh, that you would be. I hope that answers your question, Robert. Let's see, then, uh, let's see, other question. Let's see, what countries or cities did U.S. currency circulate back in the early, mid-1800s? Uh, it... Primarily around Philadelphia and uh, cities up and down the, the East Coast. I know that um, like 1793 chain cents weren't really seen outside of Philadelphia. Um, and it took time uh, for the United States Mint to be able to have the means to be able to, to adequately, um, you, know, uh, you know, furnish our entire economy. Um, you know, when you think about it, uh, the, the mint struck only, you know, in its first year, only 36,103 large cents. That's, you know, $360 that, that can't even uh, cover the uh, economy of Philadelphia, let alone, you know, all the different states. Um, you know, that and, and the large cent or the half cent coins that they struck in that year, that really wasn't anything to speak of on a, you know, national economic value. Uh, or level. So, um, you know, coins generally circulated in and around the big cities, uh, you know, Philadelphia, New York, uh, Baltimore, and Annapolis and stuff like that. And then DC when that was founded. Uh, and it really took time uh, for these coins to spread out and, and circulate on a, on a wider scale. Nice. So Jesse, are you able to see the Q&A that's coming in then? Uh, yes. Oh, okay, good. I, I didn't realize that. I didn't either. Okay. Um, so you see a question from uh, Paul H there? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So I'll uh, let you handle that one then. Uh, you know, All right. Yeah, yeah. Regarding the arbitrage question, remember a South Carolina shilling was not equal in value to a New York shilling. That, yep, that is correct. Uh, however, um, you know, a dollar in uh, South Carolina was equal to a dollar in, in New York. Uh, and that's... Um, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, what essentially mattered. There may have been slight differences, um, you know, but essentially um, it, it was what it was, you know, a dollar was worth a dollar. Uh, I know that, you know, when you get to the West Indies and stuff like that, there were differences. Um, and in fact, a lot of our, the early uh, United States dollars uh, ended up getting shipped to the West Indies and melted down there because they were in fact worth more down there than they were up here. Um, so, uh, you know, whereas we, um, you know, we're happy to import the uh, Spanish American dollars and use them up here. So the fate of our, a lot of our earliest dollars, uh, you know, wound up in the West Indies and were melted because there was a slight difference in value between the United States dollar and, and the Spanish American dollar that made it worthwhile to um, to ship them um, and mail them uh, abroad, essentially. Okay, we have one last question here. I think 
on the chat. I'm not sure if you have that open or not. Um, where it says, any thoughts on federal dimes and quarters which got heavily worn as to which decades they were heavily used and whether they were ever circulated outside major, especially northern cities? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, just um, the same, you know, as with, uh, um, you know, the Spanish American coins that eventually got worn down, um, you know, uh, eventually the United States Mint was able, they were able to furnish large amounts of uh, dimes and quarters, especially after the, the Coinage Act of 1853 and 1857, which uh, really, in, you know, saw some of the largest mintage mint figures that the mint was able to produce at all because of these acts that called for, um, you know, foreign coinage to be, be melted and turned into, um, you know, these, uh, you know, federal dimes and quarters. And in fact, um, you know, there are some reports that um, quarter dollars of 1853, which had saw, uh, you know, a huge mintage figure, they were in circulation until the 1950s. So, an entire century of, of seat at liberty, you know, coins of 1850s, uh, you know, were in circulation. Uh, oh, just, and, you know, eventually these, of course, um, you know, circulated outside of the big cities and, you know, through the course of um, uh, circulation and trade, um, you know, did go out uh, beyond. Um, but one thing you have to remember is that silver and gold coins, they weren't necessarily struck and delivered the same way that coins are today. It's not like banks, you know, said we need it coins and then the mint struck them and they were uh, released to banks. Um, you know, people had to send in their silver or gold on a private level. Um, and then the mint would strike them into coins for a fee and then send them back. Um, and uh, people far from the mint had little incentive to do this. Um, because, you know, it took time, it did cost money. Uh, there was the threat of, you know, your silver getting lost or stolen. Um, so, you know, once the further and further you got from the Philadelphia Mint or any of the mints after the 1830s, um, the less incentive you actually had to send in your, your gold and silver to have it struck into, um, you know, federal dollars uh, and divisions thereof just because, um, you know, it was a hassle, essentially. Yeah, yeah that person uh, said, uh, I guess they clarified, they said the real question was regarding bus coinage pre-1828. Uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, I mean, they, you know, they circulated outside of, you know, the big cities eventually, but, you know, uh, essentially what I was just saying uh, about the further you are physically from the mint, the less incentive you have to deliver your, you know, foreign silver or raw, you know, uh, silver uh, to the mint to have it coined. So the further away that you got from these, you know, minting facilities, um, the the less you would uh, see federal coinage, essentially. But again, through general day-to-day -day commerce, they eventually made their way out. You know, just the same as you know, Spanish American coins, you know, eventually made their way out. Um, you know, we got the bulk of our uh, coins that were in the United States, we got them from uh, the West Indies. It's not like we went to the Mexican city mint and, and requested these coins. You know, they, um, you know, came to us from our trade with, uh, you know, primarily Jamaica is where we got the, the bulk of our Spanish American coins from. Um, and, uh, you know, is, is just essentially through, you know, uh, commercial contacts that these, um, you know, pieces circulated here in the first place. Uh, you know, and then once we started striking coins from the Philadelphia Mint, it worked just, you know, in the opposite way. They eventually spread out, but it took time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's basically it. Nice. All right. Well, Dr. Kraft, I want to thank you one more time uh, for your time today. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, and we have a certificate of appreciation that we'll be sending to you. Uh, folks, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this presentation, especially because this is uh, in light of the canceled EAC uh, events. We're really glad to have uh, you know a lot of the speakers uh, from the canceled EAC convention uh, 
joining us uh, in our ANA Money Talks. Um, speaking of which, uh, please join us for our next presentation, Artistry and Technology, How the Large Scent Dyes Were Made by Bill Eckberg. And that'll be this Wednesday, August 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern, noon, uh, Mountain Daylight Time. If you would like to register for the next presentation or uh, see some of the upcoming events or even look at some of the archives, uh, please, again, check out money.org. Uh, you could just look right at the, uh, the slider going across the home page. Um, and uh, pretty easy. I uh, just uh, click where it says really big, uh, ANA eLearning Academy. Jesse, thanks again for your time. It was great Thank having you much, so much, Sam. It was a pleasure. Likewise. Yeah, hopefully uh, we can do this again, folks. Thank you uh, for your time today, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you on Wednesday at uh, noon mountain time. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.